Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Carla McFarlane, Curator of Academic Programs Research at the Ian Potter Museum of Art at the University of Melbourne. I'm our MC for this afternoon and curator of this Machine Interdisciplinary Online Forum, which is the third in an ongoing series developed in collaboration with Dr. Danny Butt, Associate Director of Research at the Victorian College of the Arts, Faculty of Fine Art and Music at the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Danny, for your collegial and insightful collaboration on this forum. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from Wurundjeri land in Kensington, Melbourne, alongside the Maribyrnong River. And thank you for joining us on Zoom from wherever you are. This is session two of three we're presenting across the week. If you'd like more information on the third session and to book, please do check the Potter website. Uh, and after my remarks, I'll drop the relevant link into chat. Today's session is co-presented with the Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Ethics at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to thank them for their contribution today and for their support. I'd now like to welcome Kelly Galatley, Director of the Ian Potter Museum of Art, to introduce this session. Hi, Carla. Thanks so much. Um, as Carla said, I'm Kelly Galatley, Director of the Potter, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the Machine Interdisciplinary Forum. As Kyla noted, it's one of a series of forums we're undertaking at the Potter that proposes art making as a form of knowledge creation alongside other academic fields of inquiry and which feature a range of our academic colleagues from across the University of Melbourne. On behalf of the Ian Potter Museum of Art and the University, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Potter Museum is located on the University of Melbourne's Parkville campus the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to any First Nations persons joining us today, whether from within Australia or further abroad. I'm also joining you via Zoom for Wurundjeri land in Melbourne's east, close to Mullum Mullum Creek, which is one of the only watercourses within urban metropolitan Melbourne that's surrounded by native and regenerated bushland for almost its entire length, and which was for tens of thousands of years used sustainably as a source of food and resources, and importantly, as a place of culture by the Wurundjeri. Each of our forums has sought to address pressing themes of our time from interdisciplinary perspectives. Previous forums have explored water and language, and now we come to machine. Today, as we experience rapidly expanding developments in areas such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, data and algorithms are increasingly impacting our daily lives. From simulating human intelligence to collecting our personal data, the machine of the computer system engages us as individuals, communities and societies, both as creators and as consumers. Presenting a diverse forum program of speakers from a range of disciplines over three afternoons, Machine is investigating the interface between humanity and machine across fields of research, including digital ethics, data analytics, creative writing, visual art, and mathematics. Yesterday, we heard from speakers from the Indigenous Data Network in the Indigenous Studies Union in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne on the machinery of creativity, indigenous data and computation. Today, we're going to hear from Jeannie Patterson and Ingmar Levy, and will later be treated to a reading from the Zener text by author Christian Bock. So now to our speakers. Jeannie Marie Patterson is a professor of law at the University of Melbourne. Jeannie is the co-director of the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics, otherwise known as CAID, a new collaborative interdisciplinary research, teaching and policy centre at the University of Melbourne. Jean is also the co-leader of Digital Ethics, the Digital Ethics Research Stream at the Melbourne Social Equity Institute and a member of the advisory board for the Australian Society of Computers and the Law. Jeannie's research and teaching focus um, on consumer protection and the regulation of new digital technologies um, is on the um, on this and the regulation of new digital technologies for effective, fair and safe outcomes. Jeannie will be speaking today on algorithmic assistance and the value of getting it wrong. Jeannie's presentation will then be followed by Inbar Levy. 
Inba is a law lecturer at the University of Melbourne and an expert on procedural justice and empirical legal research with a particular interest in behaviour and decision making, institutional design and the ethics of algorithmic machine learning. She completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford and has held a visiting research fellow position at Columbia Law School, a visiting research position at Harvard Law School and most recently, a House of Global Fellowship at NYU School of Law. Today, Ingbar will be speaking on the bright but modest potential of algorithms in the courtroom. We're also really pleased and honoured to have Liz Sonnenberg as session respondent this afternoon. Liz is PVC Research Systems, Research and Enterprise at the University of Melbourne. Following Jeannie and Ingvar's presentations, Liz will respond and lead a Q&A with our panellists. And then I'll be passing over to Kyla to introduce Christian Bock for the second part of the session. So it's my, now my pleasure to hand over to Jeannie Patterson. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners on the land on which I'm speaking, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect also to their leaders, um, past, present and emerging. I'm really delighted to be here today because these questions that we're thinking about are big questions, but also interdisciplinary questions, questions that can't be decided in one particular silo, um, but need the insights of all types of expertise and knowledges. So this is a good forum to be, to be able to be addressing. So I'm speaking on the rather um, small, but I think interesting issue of digital advisors. So I'm just gonna put up some slides. So I'm, I'm really interested in these little devices. Um, there's been a prolifer proliferation of interest um, in this modern algorithmic age of what might be called digital advisors. And these are the online tools that are developed to assist consumers in navigating complex information relevant to, to purchasing decisions. And examples include website aggregators, product selection tools, information apps, chatbots, and those things on the screen, which are virtual assistants. And if you go online, you can see that firms in financial markets are investing in robo-advisors to help us make budgeting, investment and mortgage decisions. Um, there's numerous startups in the area and government itself is thinking about joining the trend with increasing use of comparison sites and chatbot advisors. So because I'm a lawyer, <laughs> I'm going to think about how do we regulate it? Now, that question doesn't arise from an ambition to stifle innovation. It arrives because I'm interested in a consumer protection perspective and to ensure that these devices and services operate in ways that are safe, fair and effective. And the inquiry then is whether we need new law to achieve these aims or whether we can fit them into existing law. And the answer to the question about how do we regulate these advisors it really depends on how they work and the types of values we want to bring um, to how they, to, to their place in society. So a lot of the concerns about these devices are concerns about privacy and about the use of consumer data. I'm not actually going to speak about that today. These are important concerns and there's reforms in the, on the agenda of the ACCC to increase data protection. But I want to think about the quality of the advice itself, because even with great privacy protections, consumers may well hand over personal information to digital advisors precisely for the reasons that they want advice. So I think it's worth thinking about the advice itself and the risks that may come to consumers from relying on digital um, assistance, particularly around choice. Um, and the issues that arise in handing choice over to a machine. Now, some of these risks arising from the use of digital assistance are similar to those that arise in relying on any form of advisor, particularly conflicts of interests. Other risks are exaggerated by the form of the advisor. Um, advisors may appear, digital advisors appear, may appear to be more neutral and less idiosyncratic than human advisors, but in fact, take an opportunity, be taking opportunities to promote the self-interest of the firms that have um, developed them or may simply not be bringing good quality advice. 
Yet the form of the advisor in the form of it being a machine makes it very difficult for humans to interrogate those devices. And in fact, there's other consequences as well. So the fear of robots that we often see in the media is that robots will come and take over our lives. And what I'm almost suggesting to you is there might be other more insidious and subtle concerns about the growth of robot advisors or digital advisors that may challenge other aspects of uh, human existence. So perhaps the ability to choose and a variety um, and richness in our lives. So let's try and explore some of those concepts um, by thinking a bit more about digital advisors. So as I've said, we're looking at companion websites, chat box, virtual assistants. These rely on a variety of different levels of technologies. Some of them simply programmed decision trees. Others rely on more sophisticated machine learning techniques to provide autonomous or semi-autonomous device. The advice they provide may be tailored to the individual um, or it might be quite generic. And there's a difference, of course, between asking what's the best flight for me to take and where should I invest my money? The idea behind digital advisors is that they will benefit us by reducing the time we need to spend on searching for, um, searching for information. And they may also benefit us by, um, by, um, uh, by synthesizing large amounts of complex information. I mean, humans often turn to advisors when they're dealing with large and complex information. And the idea about digital advisors is that they're information intermediaries. They're taking big amounts of information and processing it and then providing information back to the consumer that is more nuanced and particularised to them. Um, overall, improving the quality of decisions that humans can make. Whether the course that actually is the case is another matter. But the perception of the infallibility and rationality of um, digital advisors will, as I've mentioned, no doubt influence consumers' use and response to such advisors. So this brings me really to the quality of um, uh, the advice that's provided and the concerns we may have about them. Sorry, I realised I'm way ahead of my slides in my excitement to speak. Um, so what, what sort of issues might arise with them? The first issue I think that arises with our reliance on digital advice is just this risk of conflicted and underwhelming advice. The purpose of the tools, as I said, is allow consumers to choose better by synthesising and repackaging information that's suitable for them. But there is a risk here of conflicted or self-interested conduct on the part of the advisors. To the extent that firms who are selling digital advisors have agreements to promote particular products or make the products themselves, this creates an environment rife with conflicts of interest. It means the consumer may be given information that promotes the economic interests of the advisor's firm rather than the well-being of the consumer. And there's certainly some evidence of this occurring. So recently, Travago, which is the hotel comparison website, was found to be promoting hotels for which it was paid a commission rather than the hotels that might pre present the best um, uh, deal for consumers. And similarly, it's possible to imagine that sort of conflict arriving in other situations. For example, advice about mortgage broking may in fact be informed by commissions payable from banks as opposed to the um, processing and synthesis of the, of the consumers in financial information to come out with the best mortgage product for them. A related risk is the potential for digital advisors to manipulate consumer choices. So here I'm concerned about the um, fact that the digital advice tools are increasing, are based on increasingly detailed information about consumers. That's the whole purpose of them. Consumers provide information about themselves, which is in some way processed by the digital advisor, varying degrees of sophistication, to produce a recommendation. Now, of course, the tools may be collecting other sorts of information indirectly as well. They may be able to bring together not merely the information that consumers given to the advisor, but they may also be um, drawing on information that comes from other sources, such as social media profiles or website engagement, browsing history and the like. Now, the potential exists here for the advisors to, become, to form 
quite sophisticated digital representations of consumers, which can then be used to steer them in particular directions. And we sometimes refer to this as digital manipulation or the use of um, digital nudges to push consumers towards particular decisions on the basis of what the recommender tool knows about them, but which aren't necessarily the most welfare enhancing decisions for the consumer. But even if the decision is of good quality, the very act of nudging um, raises questions about, um, about consumer welfare. That's because if the exercise of choice is rendered illusory through being managed or steered by choice architecture or the information that is known about the consumer's vulnerabilities, it's not really an exercise of choice on the part of the consumer. And this brings me to my uh, next concern, which is the concern about um, homogeneity and um, to choice itself. So more existential, existential concerns about the use of these digital advisors. So even if the quality of the advice is not conflicted and is not underwhelming, there's a concern about just this idea of, of, of handing over the exercise of choice to a digital advisor who we know very, perhaps know very little about the process through which the decision is made. So my concern here is, is kind of the concern that life becomes very beige. It may be that the echo chamber of offerings or the narrow band of choices displayed may not to a consumer, may not reflect the prefer their own preferences, but an outcome of a digital identity that's constructed about them. And that digital identity, as I've said, might be based on information about the individual consumer, but it's also based on information about other consumers who are said to be like the person who's seeking the advice. The result might be a narrowing of choice because if we're sort of... Um, adding together a whole lot of preferences of people who are predicted to be similar, we may just end up with one or two um, outcomes that um, show very little variety. The resulting, resulted selection of offerings might conform to the preferences of the majority in that grouping. Um, and a prediction of how closely new or emerging products might fit individual preferences simply not, may not come into the calculation. So inevitably, there'll be innovative or outlier selections which don't get, don't get prioritised and may even never hit the eyes of individual consumers, which means this, the question of what consumers don't see becomes just as important as what they do see when we come to the kind of choices that are being made. Whether this um, comes with an accompanying loss of creativity, capacity to experiment, recipe, um, receptiveness to variety and difference is, I think, a real risk. Indeed, the existential threats raised by digital advisors to consumer or individual choice um, may go even beyond this idea of the sort of beige recommendation that applies to everybody. It may, in fact, impact on the ability to exercise choice. The ability to choose is part of our own our identity as humans. It's essential to um, participation in um, liberal democracies, but it's also it's also an element where it's part of human dignity that we have this this capacity to control our own advise, adv own lives, at least in some respect. Now, the more we hand over the exercise of choice to someone else, the less we have control over the kinds of choices that are being made for us. We're not exercising choice at all, and this is there's a question here if this really undermines the. Um, the essence of human existence, or at least um, narrows it to um, narrows it further than it perhaps already is, um, while under the guise of enhancing consumer choice. So I'm coming back to the law, having delved into the existential. We want to return to the to the element of what does law do about this? Is there a legal response? Perhaps one of the issues that we see arising with um, digital advice is this is the lack of transparency about what they in fact do and the degree to which they're acting in the interests of an individual consumer or pursuing other interests. Part of the answer to these concerns might be to investigate um, just what's being offered, ask for less opacity, more transparency. The very reasons that lead consumers to seek advice combined with the back box effect of new technologies means currently, anyway, consumers have little opportunity to check on the variables that have led to a decision or understand the basis on which decision recommendations are made. 
The response might then be found in measures that require greater clarity from the decision maker or the digital advisor. The technical response is sometimes said to be explainability. Explanations of decisions may allow um, any biases to be identified and, or, or self-interest to be identified. Explainability may also allow parties to understand the process involved in making recommendations by a digital advisor so that they're better placed to challenge or reject the recommendations. It also allows a better scrutiny for regulators to review the decisions to determine whether there is in fact unacceptable levels of um, unacceptable misrepresentation or manipulation of the consumers in the recommendations that might be made to them. But of course, there's a flaw in this suggestion for greater transparency and explainability. Because the very reason that consumers may seek advice from a digital advisor is that they they don't want to navigate large amounts of information. They feel unable to make a decision in a particular circumstances or not interested in doing so. So the suggestion that we might give consumers more information so they can assess the performance of their um, digital advisor is perhaps um, illusory. The information imbalance may lead to adoption, that leads to the adoption of the tool, basically undermines attempts to provide this form of user oversight. What about performance standards? Now, in law, digital advisors are classed as providing a service. This means that the firm providing or supplying the digital advisor is required to render the service with due care and skill and that the service is fit for any identified purposes. Now, what this means is that um, recommendations that are based on undisclosed conditions or self-interest or don't really take the individual circumstances into account of the consumer to give them a better outcome probably don't fit the bill. They don't reach that standard of due care and skill. The question I'm interested in as well, though, is whether due care and skill means having regard to considerations of what might be called AI ethics in deciding um, the types of recommendations that are made and the processes we should go through. I think these are interesting ideas that could be taken further. But I want to finish by prompting the question about whether there's some choices that should not be delegated and certainly should not be delegated to a machine. Perhaps there's some decisions that shouldn't be given away. Now, here I suggest that even if digital advisors are good at making recommendations, perhaps we don't want humans to rely on them to make the recommendations. Now, why might this be? It might be because we want humans to practice making choices. Um, it's a, it sounds trite, but it's true. It's only by practicing making decisions that we get better at making decisions and indeed learn more about our existence. Sometimes mistakes are valuable to our overall well-being. Secondly, there's a concern about loss of control. The more we hand over decisions to some sort of digital advisor or automated decision makers, the greater the risk of a, lot of a lack of oversight of the decisions that are being made and the types of recommendations that individuals or consumers are being steered towards. The third one is about civil responsibilities. It's possible that there's some decisions that obtain value because they're made by humans. Um, decisions about voting, decisions about relationships, possibly even decisions about education are perhaps decisions that individuals should make themselves because they're essential to both functioning liberal democracies and indeed um, human flourishing. Can tech, so the, perhaps there are some decisions that shouldn't be handed away and perhaps the government or the reg regulations should intervene to limit the use of digital advisors or automated decision making in these circumstances. It sounds like a paternalistic intervention from government, but we do limit other sorts of choices in our society as well. Generally, we can't sell our children, our organs, um, or our bodies, in fact. So, to conclude, I'd just, I'd just finish by asking well, can technology, in fact, help? overcome these concerns about decision making. It's possible that digital advisors could be processed not to program, not to make the decisions, but to help humans become better at making their own decisions by prompting choice and reflection, by prompting regard to the, um, to the innermost workings of our interests and desires so that we become more aware decision makers rather than delegating decision makers.
These are big and interesting questions. But my point would be that we shouldn't hand away authority to technology just because we're not sure how it works or with some idealistic promise of a better life. Technology can help us, but we also need to scrutinise the type of people we want to be in our interactions with it. So thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I would also like to thank the organisers of uh, this uh, machine uh, forum uh, talk. Very much enjoyed uh, your talk. Um, Ginny, um, I'm going to talk about a related um, issue from uh, perhaps a different perspective. Um, the uh, title for this uh, talk is The Bright But Modest Potential of Algorithms uh, in the Courtroom. And, and what I really like to emphasize in this uh, talk is what uh, legal limitations or what limitations do we encounter from uh, the legal perspective uh, to the application of uh, algorithms and uh, machine learning tools uh, in the courtroom particularly from uh, the point of view of uh, legal uh, jurisprudence and uh, the rationales for uh, procedural justice. Um, and so uh, generally uh, they're uh, essential human skills in uh, judging, but uh, algorithms could help uh, systemize the judicial function and reduce the risk of uh, human error, inconsistency and uh, individual bias. Uh, however, uh, there are also risks and um, limitations in using algorithms in adjudication, uh, particularly because of uh, specific elements of legal skill and legal expertise that are required in uh, the legal world. So hopefully this will become more clear uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. I'd like to uh, begin uh, with the uh, goddess of justice. Uh, Themis, perhaps the uh, character that represents the legal world uh, more than uh, anyone. Um, and interestingly, uh, Themis, or the statues of Themis, represents her as uh, blind, so um, her uh, eyes are uh, hidden. Um, and of course, the meaning is that uh, Themis is uh, blind to any extra legal considerations. So she's supposed to be uh, neutral. She's not supposed to see anything but the relevant considerations uh, to the legal case, the legal proceeding. She's uh, only supposed to apply the uh, law to the facts of the case and uh, be completely uh, neutral and unbiased. And of course, the question is whether we see this kind of uh, neutrality in reality. So in reality, uh, we still have human judges, uh, but we also know that human intelligence is uh, fallible and imperfect. Uh, and in fact, when we ask the question uh, whether human judges are really objective and uh, rational, it almost seems to be like an unfair uh, question because the standard of uh, Themis is an inhumane uh, standard, right? We're all human, uh, we're not uh, perfect in our uh, decision-making. And so uh, judges are human, uh, they have human uh, limitations, human cognitive limitations. And the question is, could uh, AI, uh, algorithms, machine learning tools, uh, digital tools, uh, tools provide a solution to uh, these uh, limitations and perhaps uh, provide this uh, modern form of, uh, of Themis, of the goddess of uh, justice. Um, generally, justice is the most uh, basic yeah, human concept. Uh, John Rawls uh, said that it is the first virtue of social institutions. Uh, Tim uh, Scannell, the philosopher, said uh, justice is what we owe to each other. Uh, justice is conceived to be a notion that is in relation to another person, so it's something someone else uh, owes me. And one of the most definitions, um, one of the most important definitions or um, elements of uh, justice is uh, decisions that are not arbitrary, arbitrary decisions, decisions that are uh, neutral and uh, unbiased. And that's why it is uh, important to check whether using uh, algorithms, using machine learning tools could indeed uh, answer these uh, needs of uh, justice. Um, so we're starting from human intelligence, moving on to artificial intelligence and um, checking whether uh, artificial intelligence tools could uh, provide a solution in the legal context. I'd like to start very generally with uh, just mentioning that uh, human cognitive um, 
the human cognition is uh, limited or there are limitations to the human cognition before I move on to uh, examine the different uh, leg legal uh, elements that are relevant for uh, machine learning. Uh, this is because uh, machine learning tools are often compared to human decision making and it's important to note that while algorithms are not perfect, uh, humans are not perfect either. So we're comparing an imperfect system to an, another imperfect system at the moment, uh, at least. Um, and the question is, which system could uh, perhaps perform which tasks in a better way? Maybe, and that would be my conclusion, uh, we want to think about a combination of both human intelligence and artificial intelligence, uh, depending on the specific tasks. So there would be tasks that uh, humans are better at and tasks that are um, better performed by an algorithm. Uh, so very generally, human uh, cognition is uh, limited. The term bounded rationality um, was coined by uh, Herbert Simon quite a long uh, time ago. So humans have a limited calculative ability. They also have a very imperfect uh, memory, very bad memory, uh, to say the least, the least. And they also have a limited willpower and limited attention. Now to deal with the fact that our cognitive abilities are uh, imperfect, we use uh, mental shortcuts and rules of thumb. And these rules of thumb uh, might lead to mistakes in uh, decision making. So uh, I'm sure many of, you, many of you are familiar with uh, uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman's book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, Kahneman uh, won the uh, Economics and Nobel Prize for his work with uh, Amos uh, Tversky about these two systems of uh, thinking. So system one is the uh, intuitive system. It's quick. It uses uh, shortcuts, uh, rules of thumbs, but it's also likely to lead to mistakes in decision making. And system two is the uh, logical, slow, intentional system. Uh, that is less likely to lead to mistakes, but it requires more mental resources. And our mental resources, our cognitive resources are limited. We can't always use uh, system uh, two. Uh, so an example for system one is uh, driving on an uh, autopilot. So if you ever uh, drove home and were thinking about something else uh, on the way and you, and you uh, got home and you uh, didn't remember what, uh, what happened where you uh, drove by and you just kind of somehow uh, got there. An example uh, for system two is a system uh, that we use when we are, for example, trying to file a tax form, okay? So a system that requires a lot of uh, uh, logical, a lot of uh, effort. Um, it's uh, important to mention that these uh, mental shortcuts or that system one uh, normally works. That's why we use system one, but sometimes it leads to uh, mistakes. It's also important to know that we all use uh, both systems. So we all use uh, both the intuitive system and the logical system. When it comes to judicial decision making, uh, it seems that at least according to the legal theory, we want to encourage logical uh, decision making. So we want to encourage uh, system two. Uh, we don't want judges to uh, make decisions uh, intuitively, perhaps. We can uh, maybe think about it uh, some more, but we want them to apply the law uh, to the facts of the case in a logical way. Uh, but they are human, so they do use uh, intuition. They're also very busy. The judicial system is extremely um, overloaded, yeah, with uh, um, a lot of cases, um, a lot of uh, information, a lot of data that judges have to uh, read. And uh, that leads to uh, cognitive uh, overload. I just want to give one example for uh, a human uh, shortcut, um, just to exemplify uh, what I'm talking about. And perhaps you can think, take this example and consider how would an algorithm perform better than a human being in this situation. So the example is an example about chocolate and jam. I know it sounds uh, strange. So the uh, studies about uh, chocolate and uh, jam give people a choice um, of uh, buying, either buying or not buying uh, chocolate or jam. And the question is, when are you more likely to buy uh, chocolate? Uh, when you're presented with limited options, so when you're presented with three, four options, or when you're presented with 
uh, multiple uh, uh, choices. So when you're presented with 10, 12, 15 types of chocolate. Now, when we think about the uh, rational decision making, we might say that you're more likely to buy chocolate or jam when you're presented with more choice because you're more likely to find the chocolate that you like. If you like mint chocolate, for example, um, you're more likely to find it under the long uh, list of um, uh, options. Uh, however, we see that people tend to avoid the decision, meaning people tend to buy less when presented with more choice. And that's because um, of uh, the factor of cognitive overload. So the choice uh, is just too much when you're presented with too many options. People are more likely to buy chocolate or jam when they're presented with only three, four uh, flavors. Now, this is not only about chocolate or jam. There are studies that were conducted with real judges uh, that were presented with a list of uh, long factors, okay? a long list of uh, legal factors showing that when judges are presented with a long list of factors, they're more likely to ignore these factors, comparing to a situation when they're presented with only two or three legal factors. And there are many legal rules that are constructed in this way, legal rules that require the judge to consider 10 different uh, things without saying how much weight should be given to each consideration. That creates a cognitive overload because we're talking about a human uh, decision maker. If we want judges to take into account uh, 10, 15, 20 um, different considerations, perhaps we need to assist them with the use of algorithms that are able to process uh, more information. So that's just, just one uh, example to kind of uh, consider, uh, consider that, uh, of course, also relates not only to the uh, limited mental capacities of uh, human judges, but also uh, relates to the fact that there's just a lot of data that uh, judges have to uh, deal with uh, in the uh, legal uh, world uh, with these uh, limitations of time and, and attention. Okay, so um, I want to move on and talk about different legal skills and whether these would be performed better by a human judge or by an algorithm and just explore these um, uh, particular uh, issues. So we're going to have uh, three or four uh, issues. The first one uh, I'd like to discuss is the issue of interpretation. Uh, so uh, one legal skill that is arguably beyond the realm of uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence is that of uh, interpretation. Uh, language skills are integral to legal expertise uh, because the law is expressed in language and the meaning and uh, interpretation of language is frequently the focus of uh, legal debates and focus of legal decisions. Uh, legal interpretation is a part of the judicial function. Now, uh, different words could mean different things in different contexts and the judge must use her discretion in any given set of circumstances in order to give the legal norm its uh, practical meaning. Uh, here, algorithms face a challenge when interpreting uh, laws or evidence because uh, AI cannot understand language in the same way that humans understand language. Um, we're talking about, uh, for example, the use of uh, natural language processing, uh, NLP, and this poses uh, real uh, difficulties. Uh, natural language processing, processing is... Um, a system of uh, super, supervised learning, uh, meaning that humans have to label vast amounts of data to enable the uh, machine to understand. Yeah, language, it doesn't really uh, understand. We can discuss what is uh, to really understand. But um, under a supervised uh, learning system, the uh, result um, is a machine uh, scanning a raw data um, that uh, might be unstructured and useless for uh, human need. This is unsupervised. That's why we require the uh, supervised uh, learning. Um, and so the challenges is that uh, humans have to label yeah, these, uh, the data in order to enable the machine to uh, understand it. And that's not always uh, possible. Uh, there are scholars that are more optimistic about the ability of AI to develop NLP skills using a semi-supervised training, 
uh, and even uh, through artificial uh, neural networks. So perhaps uh, these things are still uh, to come. But I just want to uh, show you one study that demonstrates why it is uh, difficult to uh, teach um, an algorithm uh, to how to understand the yeah, language and uh, legal language. So this is one particular uh, study, a novel study that uh, used natural language uh, processing tools. And the study managed to uh, predict the outcome of cases tried by the European Court of Human Rights based uh, only on textual content. And actually the study was extremely uh, successful. So uh, the study was set to predict whether a particular article of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, has been violated. And their researchers used uh, textual, textual features to train a support vector machine uh, classifiers. This is a form of uh, supervised learning again. And they achieved a high accuracy of 79% on average. Uh, however, this study is, uh, even though it was limit, it's successful in predicting legal outcomes, it is uh, limited to a specific context in which the text extracted from uh, the legal documents bear a sufficient number of similarities. And that is, that is explained in the uh, paper. So in other words, this study used a particular legal context in which the applications and the judgments are written in a very specific way, a very particular way. So it was easy to teach the algorithm how to read it. Uh, now that's not normally the case when we talk about uh, legal uh, decisions. Uh, normally, uh, judges have different writing styles and they are not normally limited to a specific uh, format. Uh, and that's why in most cases currently it would be difficult to use NLP uh, tools to uh, teach an algorithm how to understand, how to read uh, legal uh, judgments. Uh, perhaps in future, in certain cases, we would require a standard format from human judges in order to create a database that is more suited uh, for uh, an algorithm. Perhaps a, format, a specific format of judgments would be mandated in order to allow yeah, its analysis. Um, so we see a very optimistic result, but limited to a particular form, a particular uh, legal context, and that's not uh, the rule. That's not always the case. Uh, another uh, challenge is um, the challenge of applying legal uh, standards. And here we also see uh, perhaps uh, the elusive nature of legal uh, expertise and perhaps uh, the elusive nature of legal rules. So even though the idea of law suggests uh, that there's a need for clear rules that produce just and predictable results in order to govern society, um, in reality, many rules are uncertain in scope and uh, in some areas, no rules have yet been uh, developed. So judges are confronted with the task of deciding cases for which the law uh, seems to provide no clear answer. And that happens uh, quite, uh, quite often. Now, uh, this uncertainty is uh, not something that we always want to prevent because it's always a result, it's sometimes a result of the need to maintain flexibility. So there are uh, circumstances that cannot be predicted in advance. In these cases, we use uh, legal standards instead of legal uh, rules. Uh, so legal standards uh, are less certain than uh, legal rules. A standard would be, for example, one has to uh, drive reasonably, right? And a rule would be uh, one uh, can't um, speed over 80 kilometers per hour. So these elusive terms of uh, reasonable, proportionate, just, these are all standards and terms that we use in the legal context in order to allow flexibility in future legal cases. And that makes it uh, really hard to put into a model, to put into an algorithm, because the rule is not uh, clear, intentionally not clear, and it's open uh, to future uh, interpretation which uh, again leads to the question of whether and how uh, it would be possible to uh, model yeah, the, these type of uh, legal, uh, legal rules. Um, this relates to the question of uh, legal reasoning uh, as well. Legal reasoning is also often uh, explained or in legal reasoning we often use uh, terms that are not as uh, clear cut. 
uh, very generally, law is a social institution, and uh, the social nature of the law is also uh, inherently linked to the process of legal uh, reasoning. So when a judge uh, gives a judgment, they provide reasoning and explanation for that uh, judgment. Now, uh, legal reasoning is necessary to uh, explain the outcome of a legal uh, decision. The only way to contest a decision is by referring to the reasoning in that decision. Uh, but uh, legal reasoning is also a skill that is um, a necessary condition for the development of legal systems, especially in the common, in the common law world. So the common law world is based on precedence, um, meaning that judges rely on previous decisions given by other judges and rely on their reasoning. So in order for the law to develop, we uh, must uh, have a system of um, explainability, a system of uh, legal reasoning. And uh, this really underlines the need for the community to be involved in the resolution of legal ambiguity, um, because uh, often uh, we need legal reasoning when the legal question is a question about controversial uh, social questions, controversial social issues. Uh, these cannot simply be decided based on exi existing data. So these cannot be decided based on uh, judgments fed into a model because the process must allow for legal development and, and social change. Um, so first, uh, we need this process of legal reasoning for legal change, for social change. Um, and that cannot currently at least be done by uh, an algorithm because it's a social uh, decision. And secondly, of course, it leads to uh, questions of uh, black box and machine learning explainability, because we can't always explain the um, decision-making process of a uh, machine of uh, an algorithm. Um, the last uh, issue, or the last couple of issues I'll mention in uh, the couple of minutes I have uh, left is um, the issue of uh, life experience and empathy. So life experience and the ability to empathize are qualities often uh, looked for in judicial uh, appointments. Uh, this leads to the question of whether an algorithm could perhaps be even more empathetic than a human judge. That could be the case, uh, by the way. For example, there are uh, professionals or humans that suffer from empathy uh, fatigue or compassion fatigue. Perhaps, perhaps we can teach an algorithm how to be uh, empathetic without uh, getting, uh, getting uh, too tired, yeah, of uh, seeing uh, difficult uh, cases. And of course, um, and this is a question that is uh, discussed a lot in the literature, I'm not going to go into it uh, in too much uh, uh, depth, um, but uh, there is uh, the question of uh, bias and uh, transparency issues in relation to uh, algorithms, going back to the uh, chocolate example, the purpose is to find a mechanism that is better uh, than a human uh, judge. Could we use uh, algorithms to uh, treat issues of uh, bias? So of course, a fundamental objective of the law is equal treatment uh, before the law, which uh, requires treating like cases alike and different cases uh, differently. Uh, achieving this goal is uh, difficult when we talk about uh, human uh, judgment. Uh, so we know that algorithms could contribute to this issue of uh, bias, um, at least in the sense that they're able to consistently replicate outcomes using the same similar output. Okay, so uh, no matter their, uh, the number of uh, factors or uh, complexity, they're able to process a large amount of uh, information and to achieve uh, consistency even with a vast amount of complicated data. Uh, the problem is that the uh, data that the algorithms are using is data that was created by uh, human beings and there's a concern that this data already contains uh, bias decisions. If that's the case, algorithms could just be amplifying uh, bias instead of uh, uh, reducing it. And this is a quote from the Australian Human Rights Commission on uh, human rights and uh, technology, also about this issue of uh, transparency uh, that I mentioned when I talked about uh, legal reasoning. Um, yeah, so I'll finish up now. It's a lot to cover in uh, 20 minutes, but hopefully this uh, gave you some uh, sense of, uh, kind of the different issues or the different legal complexities in uh, using algorithms and uh, machine learning uh, tools. 
and I'll leave, of course, some time for questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Kelly and to the organisers. I'm Liz Sonnenberg, and um, my role of the next 20 minutes or so is to uh, briefly respond and, and to facilitate the uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll start with a few personal observations, um, but uh, then uh, very keen to draw on the questions in the Q&A window. So just a reminder that you can add your own or you can vote up others, and we'll be keeping a close eye on those. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to be here, partly to hear uh, the expert and thought-provoking presentations from both uh, Jeannie and from Inbar, uh, but also my own research touches on some of these topics. Um, for example, I've got a couple of uh, current projects, one on explanation uh, and one on machine deception, that I look at them very much from a computational perspective, um, uh, working uh, with uh, colleagues such as uh, Jeannie Inbar from uh, social sciences and other areas to bring um, domain insight, not just computational perspectives. And it was pretty interesting, I thought, to hear the contrasting perspectives from Jeannie and from Inbar. Uh, from a consumer protection perspective, Jeannie was focusing on on the risks of relying on algorithmic support, whereas Inbar uh, was focusing on the potential benefits of relying on algorithmic support. So there are clearly um, uh, both potential and risks uh, for moving into a more digitally supported decision-making environment. Um, and a couple of the common themes across both presentations was the challenge of opacity of machine decision-making uh, and the challenges of either achieving greater consistency or perhaps embedding greater uh, bias and reducing choice by relying on data-driven approaches. And, and in, in different ways, both have, have challenged us to think about to what extent can we, as humans, design either human facilitated or technologically facilitated um, enablers or barriers to misuse uh, and to improve outcomes. And both coming from a, a legal perspective, uh, are acutely uh, kind of familiar with the many regulatory legal frameworks that we have, uh, whether it be managing privacy or consumer safety and so on around products um, that are not digital and to what extent to, can we draw on that, that complex ecosystem of, regular, of legal frameworks to adapt to digital arrangements uh, or do we need new ones? And I'm um, not sure we got to an answer on, on either of those uh, matters just yet, but perhaps we'll get there by the end. Um, I'm going to uh, offer a question to Jeannie um, then after Jeannie's had an answer, a question to Inbar, and then we'll throw it open to the Q&A. So Jeannie, um, you're, you started with the question as to whether through existing or new legal frameworks, um, we, we could do better uh, in consumer protection. Um, but there's a cost. If every time you bring in a set of regulate, regulatory arrangements, um, there's the establishment of the regulatory body, there's the support of uh, the authority, uh, there's the cost to the providers of the service because they have to comply, and then there's the toing and froing around whether or not they do, etc. So as a consumer, I might prefer to simply be an informed and cautious user of the free Travago Travel Advisory Service rather than pay and wait, perhaps, for a certified service. However, if it's a high consequence decision, um, as a consumer, I'll very likely prefer a regulated and certified service. So as a proponent of regulation, at least as you are for this hour or so, um, do you agree that there perhaps are some threshold issues here and do you have any advice as to how one might determine the useful threshold of applicability? Um, and complementary piece, uh, uh, how far could we alternatively achieve protection by education rather than regulation? 
Um, well, those are very, very pertinent questions, Liz. Thank you. A field I'm particularly interested in actually is called is, is regulatory design, which is where we don't look for a one stop fix to a problem, but actually recognise that most problems are complex and also dynamic. Um, so I think you're quite right. We shouldn't just say, okay, we're going to have one entity that controls all digital algorithmic advisors and these are the standards we have to meet because they were both stifling intervention, but not necessarily um, reflect consumer preferences. Because if I'm, there's probably no, in fact, there is no harm with people deciding, I don't, it's really boring shopping for socks. Somebody should just buy the socks for me, right? That's a perfectly valid choice. But we may not think that people take, should take the same view to choices about um, whether their children should go to school or, as I said, who they should vote for. So a nuanced approach is more appropriate, but I think that can exist within our system. And the other point you mentioned is education and how perhaps we need to recognise that human understanding of how we interact with technology digital advisors or other kinds of technologies is going to change as we become more familiar with them. And here education does have a really role, big role to play. I guess my point is that, some, that education, I think, needs to encourage an informed scepticism as opposed to simply um, a blind enthusiasm. So that, that would really be my answer, that it's a combination of mechanisms and Education has a lot, a lot of a role to play, provided we educate people to ask questions, which almost solves the problem, doesn't it, of losing the ability to choose? Because if you can ask questions, you're probably maintaining that function. Great, thank you. Well, I'm sure there'll be some follow-up on that. But in the meantime, let me turn to Indra. Um, uh, you, you're, you included the observation that uh, what we're perhaps doing is trying to compare an imperfect human system with likely imperfect technological systems, and, and you're advocating ways of augmenting and supporting, not substituting human decision-making. But uh, many of the issues that um, you touched on and Jeannie touched on around hidden biases and so on uh, are as relevant to how you might support and provide judges with um, guardrails and guidance as they are for consumer protection. So just wondering if um, you've given some thought as to what this means for the nature of how you might prepare judges um, and the nature of how you might certify the quality of the decision support or the advice that they're getting that they in turn will apply their own judgment to. And in a way, this links to one of the questions in the Q&A from anonymous attendee that touches on um, the um, not only what is advised, but what is hidden. So uh, turning, oh, sorry, I've made that perhaps a slightly too complex a question, but um, to, to just to repeat, do you have any views on how future preparation of judges might be, uh, might need to occur? and how certification of the advice from digital tools might arise. Thank you, Liz. It's such a good question, and I think also relates to Jeannie's point about how we as humans are going to change together with this introduction of um, new algorithms or new tools. Um, there are uh, programs for judges uh, to uh, train them on uh, bias and issues of bias. So they take uh, bias test uh, and they um, see what the results, it's all anonymous of course, but they see whether they are likely to discriminate particular uh, litigants and, and that seems to help. So in the psychological literature we see that awareness could be extremely useful in uh, dealing with these uh, issues of bias. And of course we would want to use a similar mechanism in training an algorithm maybe in a different way so we wouldn't have the algorithm take the same test but maybe um, you would know better than I am there would be ways to take out uh, irrelevant uh, considerations from uh, the data so, or it would, it would be easier to uh, mark considerations such as uh, uh, considerations but factors such as uh, age and gender and see whether they have affected the data and maybe uh, in some way uh, resolve that. Uh, there were several attempts 
really old attempts actually like from the not really old but uh, from the uh, 70s um, to help judges using uh, linear models so to reduce this uh, problem of cognitive uh, overload so instead of having to uh, go through each consideration on their own they just had to insert uh, values into a model into a system uh, so for each consideration they had to uh, say yes or no and then the algorithm came back with a decision it wasn't a binding decision on the judge but it just showed them whether their intuition was similar to the uh, decision making process of the algorithm so that was uh, used to um, resolve this issue of cognitive uh, overload so with decisions that required require them to consider 10 15 uh, or uh, many, many factors. So uh, the, the way I see it at the moment is, and I think many legal scholars would agree, is algorithms as a decision-making tool, not as a final uh, decision-maker, but rather uh, as uh, something that could accompany a human decision-making and perhaps um, give judges information about how they make decisions and help them with this training. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Coming from the technological side, I suspect you're a little bit more optimistic about the uh, straightforwardness of taking out hidden bias from the algorithms. Um, there's quite an industry on that at the moment, and uh, there seems to be throwing up more challenges than solutions. But let us turn to some of the, uh, uh, the Q&A on the list here. And question for either or both of you, which is uh, not, not <coughs> sorry, which is about remedies. What types of legal or policy remedies do you have in mind could be put in place in either of your, from either of your perspectives that might assist with the challenges that you see? Or is this yet another area for new thinking? Um, which of us would you like to go first? Please go first, Jeannie. Um, so this is about remedies? Remedies. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, um, what we should be focusing is stopping problems arising more than attributing remedies. If we have a cliff, we can put a um, ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, which is a remedy for people who fall off. We can put a fence at the top of the cliff so people don't fall over. So my preference would be to think about strategies that prevent harms arising rather than providing remedies later on. And I may have been too legalistic in, that, in my answer to the question uh, because I think, I think we can work out ways of providing remedies. It's actually harder to stop it occurring in the first place, but ultimately um, more useful, in fact. Inva, comment on remedies? I can only agree with, uh, with Jeannie. Yeah, and this was a remedy because I guess, of course, if we're talking about the financial harm, then maybe compensation would be a good enough solution. But the remedies that don't don't tend to be a perfect. Um, yeah, they, they don't tend to put us where we were uh, before so, um, so, the harm is. So, in relation, for example, to compensation, and um, it then goes to the attribution of agency. Um, so, is it the producer? Is it the certifier? Is it the failure of education? Where, 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 is the, where does the responsibility fall for failure of somewhere in this complex e ecosystem that combines um, a, a software engineer, a software designer, a software deployer, a user interface, a human absorbing all that at the end? Uh, again, so so the analogy that's often made here is with um, product liability. Mm -hmm. So when we think about products that are harmful, uh, we tend not to ask, well, what was the role of the chemical, uh, the chemist? What was the role of the of the um, person who was responsible for the packaging? We tend not to attribute individual liability. We rather look at the institution that had control over the process and responsibility for oversight. So I think that in the case at least of digital advisors, responsibility lies with the firm, the corporation that is holding out that um, technology is able to give advice. So if you hold a technology out as able to give advice and then the advice is harmful, 
or doesn't do what it says it's going to do, the firm is responsible. And it's no excuse to say, oh, well, we didn't know it was going to do that, or it's evolved. Sometimes I hear arguments, oh, well, it's, it's machine learning, so it's evolved. We didn't know it was going to evolve in that way. It's not really an answer because it's the, the firm who is holding the product out is responsible for what it does. I'm just thinking about uh, accountability and responsibility, I guess, from the human uh, judge uh, point of view. Um, and, and of course, a part of a legal uh, reasoning and explainability is this notion of accountability. So judgments are uh, public and anyone can read them, anyone can attend uh, a court, um, a hearing. Um, and so uh, even, if, even if we don't really know what were the real reasons behind this human decision, at least we have a tool to assess um, this judge's accountability or responsibility. So at least we have something to... Uh, work with it sounds more challenging in uh, the context that Jeannie is, uh, is talking about uh, so perhaps it's something we would have to uh, develop again not saying that the the legal uh, human system is perfect because judges of course can write in the judgment uh, things that uh, are not really the things that led to the to the decision and sometimes they're not even aware of the real factors that led to the decision so it's not uh, intentional or with with malice uh, yeah the question was, is this a case of the products are halfway around the world before the law, capital letters, shouted, has its boots on? So you know, perhaps a version of that is, um, is, the law go is the law too slow to catch up to the technological developments? And again, uh, opportunity for either of you to, to comment. Jeannie, a comment? Um, I, I think... <laughs> I think that's right, actually, or there's a risk of that. Um, I think the law has... I'm a lawyer, so I can criticise my own profession. I think perhaps the law has been a little bit bedazzled by the technology the, and what it can offer. And I think we have to remember Imbar's point that in the advice space, in the space of who's providing advice to consumers, the quality of advice is often really bad. I mean, the Financial Services Royal Commission made the point that financial advice and mortgage advice is is often a very low quality. And you have this problem where consumers are unable to assess the quality of advice and often end up worse off. So in that sense, the idea of a neutral, informed, digital or algorithmic advisor is very um, attractive. And the concerns that have come up have been concerns about privacy and data management, which I've said are important, but not the only stories. So I think, I think the law is now thinking, starting to think about this issue uh, but as we've said, it's not, it's not a question about the law in isolation. When we think about regulatory systems, we're not just thinking about the law. We're thinking about the whole suite of um, processes that go into that. So that's, that's how computer scientists themselves think about these products, how the firms think about the products, the education that sits around the products, and then the products themselves. So, yes, the law has been too slow. The law is often too, is often too slow, actually. Um, but I think... They're well and truly onto the case now, and we, we can only we can only go further with having conversations like this one. In fact, but I think one of the obstacles here is a deeply technological one. And looking at yeah. comment, comment on the uh, on the Q and A line that um, <clears throat> in relation to ongoing gendered and racially racialized biases, elements abound in digital in the digital realm, and often still in law. And uh, I think from a technological perspective, the engineers have tended to be optimists. Uh, and the evidence is that the elimination, the identification and elimination of bias is a much more complex business than has been uh, addressed successfully to date. So I think uh, there may be some merit in the law encouraging or other or societal patterns encouraging a slowing down of some activities. We've seen that in, in a variety of areas where you know, facial recognition has its pluses, has its minuses, uh, and at different times and different groups, uh, the balancing out of those are, are seen quite differently, different cultural groups, different uh, perspectives. Um, I, I just respond to that before Inbar, which is I quite agree with you because I think there is also a conversation about maybe we just don't turn some things on or we switch them off. Like te technology is an answer to some issues, but it's not necessarily the answer to every, every issue. And I guess the point that's also made is 
technology doesn't fix social problems that that are already in place in society. So discrimination and bias exist in society. It's it's a tall order to expect um, technology to fix that. And equally, if the if the overall um, if we have problems with advice being given to individuals in society, again, it's not clear that technology will fix that until we think about how we as a society deal with those problems. So often these problems are what sometimes are called socio-technical problems rather than purely technical problems or purely social problems. And I'm sure Inba has actually a view on that as well. Over to you, Inba. Yeah, I agree, first of all, that the law is, is, is slower than we would... Uh, uh, than we would like. Uh, I don't think it's a, a specific to uh, technology. Maybe specifically it rises now in, in the context of technology. But I mean, even with illegal downloading, we can't say that, that there is full you know, enforcement uh, yet or with regulating uh, social uh, media. So the law is always a little bit behind. We take time to think um, whether to regulate a particular uh, domain or not, I mean, for a good reason, right? So, uh, for example, with social media, uh, there are many scholars who think we shouldn't regulate it for, you know, reasons that relate to freedom of speech. So the process of, is is a bit longer. But I agree with you, Lisa. Perhaps slow, slowing things down could be uh, useful uh, in that uh, in that respect. Yeah, and I very much agree with uh, with Jeannie and and, and the second uh, point. As a closing theme, there are a couple of comments uh, on the Q&A that are quite quite linked. Um, one, what might be the consequences of shifting power and controls? Um, humans are guided to develop their own decision-making systems, and this is enabled with machine decision-making. To meta is the question. Uh, and down to uh, Geordie Zhang's question, um, as we think about uh, to what extent our minds and, and, and social collective minds can be influenced by greater presence of, of digital influence, will this affect our human self-identity and so on? So some, some meta-analyses or meta-comments about the bringing together of the digital and the societal. Uh, did you want to, from a, a legal framework perspective, again, Jeannie and then Ingvar, just... You know, some final closing kind of comments. Um, I'm really interested. I'm getting the giggles now. Um, <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the idea of um, human machine collaboration in a genuine sense, and I think that I found Inba's um, talk really interesting because she goes, she develops that idea quite a lot further than I've seen in a lot of contexts. Um, because it seems to me that if we're worried about human the thing I'm worried about, which is human choice, human decision-making. Uh, one solution is to think about ways where um, technology can assist in that process, can kind of scaffold decision-making to help us become better at at least the important decisions. I mean, I don't really mind about who decides who buys the socks, as I said, but those important sessions, it may be possible to use technology to, to assist the making of better decisions or at least getting better at making decisions. And I think that's a real, a really interesting area and a positive one. The question I grapple with is, and somebody else in the questions mentioned that given how complex um, uh, algorithmic tools are, how do we ever be sure that it's a collaborative process as opposed to, you know, a manipulative process. And I, I don't quite know the answer to that, but I think that there is potential in thinking about collaboration instead of replacement. Um, yeah, perhaps I'll mention the points about uh, appeals now, because when we talk about a human judge uh, um, in a lower jurisdiction, there's a possibility of appealing to a higher uh, jurisdiction. And, and perhaps it also relates to the issue of accountability and responsibility that uh, was mentioned before. But the first part of your question was about transferring the responsibility to an algorithm and perhaps uh, that is another part of the problem. Uh, where do we uh, appeal to? Can we fire an arg- algorithm if uh, he's not good at his job? Uh, it's not good at his job. And uh, if uh, presumably if we have a really good algorithm, then we wouldn't need this uh, mechanism of, of appeal of going and asking um, another higher jurisdiction with more expertise. What is the... Uh, the uh, the right uh, the right answer. So uh, that's in relation to um, the first uh, part of your question, and the second question about whether it uh, changes us. 
Um, well, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, so it's a big question uh, for me uh, for me to to answer. Um, it, it would it it could change uh, the legal system uh, for the better if it is used in the way that uh, Jeannie uh, suggested to to inform uh, judges of their decision making process and to have this kind of uh, back and forth or a feedback uh, mechanism instead of replacing uh, the judge entirely. In my opinion, um, a lot of the literature about developing legal expertise or expertise of any kind emphasizes this notion of feedback. So in order to learn, we really need to know what we've done uh, wrong. And if an algorithm could help us with providing information about what we've done wrong or about things that we haven't intended to do, then that could uh, inform the human decision uh, as well. So the idea of this collaborative process, I think, is much more appealing than the idea of an algorithm just replacing uh, human beings in the legal context. So it seems that uh, we remain mostly technological optimists, which is terrific. I note that uh, there's a, a final question on the, uh, on the line there about uh, possible human lack of self-esteem in comparison to machines, and that uh, perhaps the... In, Flip side of that is uh, our capacity to design algorithms that uh, work in a way that engender trust on behalf of the human consumer of those. Um, again, uh, as with explanation and justification and many of the other topics you've covered, um, active studies of con consideration in the computational communities and act increasingly active collaborations with social scientists to ensure that uh, the computer scientists are asking the right questions and answering them in, in thoughtful ways. So I think that brings us to the close. Uh, and uh, I think I now turn over back to you, Kelly. It's me, Kyla here. Hello. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Just to throw everybody off. Um, I'd just love to thank uh, Jeannie Nimbar for their great talks this afternoon and, and you, Liz, too, for your fantastic response and um, generating such a stimulating discussion that I really love just sitting back and listening to that. Um, and also to our attendees, um, there were some really fantastic questions uh, in the Q&A there. So thank you, everybody. Um, now we move on to the second part of our session, which is a bit of a change um, in focus and tone, um, and that's a live reading by Christian Bock. Uh, as Kelly mentioned in her introduction, one of the key motivations um, of our interdisciplinary forum series is to really align creative practice with other forms of research as knowledge creation. Um, and as we address the pressing themes of our time in these forums, really productive and serendipitous connections can be observed across disciplines, art making included. And we've taken the same broad church approach to creative practice as all the other disciplines um, and variously engaged performance, literature and song alongside visual art practice uh, in previous forums. And in Machine, we've turned to literature and visual art and are really pleased to present Kristen's reading as the first of two creative contributions this week. His practice brings a really exciting, enduring, and I think you'll see a very expansive take on the broader theme of Machine and our human relationship to it. Christian Bock is the author of Unoya from 2001, a best-selling work of experimental literature, which has gone on to win the Griffith Prize for Poetic Excellence. Christian is currently working on the Xenotext, a project that requires him to encipher a poem into the genome of a bacterium capable of surviving in any inhospitable environment. Christian's a fellow in the Royal Society of Canada and he teaches at the University of Melbourne where we're lucky to have him as Professor of Creative Writing in the School of Culture and Communication. Christian is going to introduce us to and read from his quite remarkable project, Xenotext. Welcome, Christian. Hello, everyone. Uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here today. 
I would like, of course, to acknowledge that I'm addressing you from the lands of the Wurundjeri, and I want to pay my respects to the elders, both before us and beside us, who walk with us together into the future. Uh, thank you to our hosts at the Ian Potter Museum for allowing me to address you today. I'm very grateful. Uh, I'd like to just uh, note that I'm going to be performing for for you uh, some excerpts from a work entitled The Xenotext. The Xenotext is a project continually ongoing that we're working on now for the last 20 years. The project requires that I write a very short poem and then through a process of encipherment, I translate this poem into a sequence of genetic nucleotides and then with the assistance of a laboratory, I actually build this gene in the lab uh, decoding my poem so that it can be implanted into the genome of a bacterium, replacing part of its genetic code with my text, so that the organism now becomes a living embodiment of my body. Moreover, I've written this poem in such a way that the organism can actually interpret that gene sequence as a set of instructions for building a protein. And the organism then responds by actually making this protein, whose sequence of amino acids is itself an encipherment for a totally different poem that also makes sense and is perfectly readable as well. Now, this kind of project, of course, must be perceived probably as a work of mad science. And I've managed successfully to get uh, this construct to work properly in a colony of E. coli bacteria. But that's not the intended host for this project. I'm intending to transform genetically a microorganism called Dinococcus radiodurans, an extremophile capable of surviving in all kinds of inhospitable environments. This organism is so durable that it can repair its own DNA uh, so quickly that it does not typically evolve or change. It doesn't even need really to adapt to its environment because it is already so well adapted to the utter lethality of the universe. You can uh, freeze it, wither it, scorch it, and it will not die. It can survive in the open vacuum of outer space. You can even blast it with a thousand times the dosage of gamma radiation that would instantly kill a human being and it will continue to persist despite these adversities. Now, by putting my poem into this organism, I could conceivably be writing a book that might outlast terrestrial civilization, and it could perhaps be on the planet Earth when the sun explodes. I'm in fact trying to write a book that lasts forever, an utterly ambitious project still ongoing, and I can't be yet certain that I'll be able to accomplish this final feat. Now I'm gonna perform for you uh, these two little poems so that you get some taste of them, after which I'll then perform for you uh, an excerpt uh, from the Zeno text. This uh, work uh, has two poems. They're short little sonnets, the first of which is nicknamed Orpheus. And this is the poem that I've written and enciphered as a genetic sequence. And this text reads, any style of life is prim, Oh, stay, my lyre, with wily ploys, moan the riff, the riff of any tune aloud, moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now the organism would read this poem implanted into its genome, and in response, it writes this following poem, nicknamed Eurydice, and it reads, The fairy is rosy of glow. In fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay. Ooh, stay, my lyre. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy. Now, I might note that when that poem, Eurydice, appears in the xenotext in this organism, uh, it's tagged with a, a fluorophore, a little molecule that actually causes the organism to glow rubescently in the dark. It actually becomes a little fairy that glows with the rosiness attributed to the fairy in the poem. So the poem now actually performs what it's saying when it uh, writes this work. And this is how, in fact, you can tell that the poem is operating functionally within the organism. You can see that this extremophile would be glowing rosily in the dark. Now, what I'd like to do for you uh, is uh, perform a, a, a sequence of uh, poetry that is the final uh, set 
a section from my book entitled The Xenotext, Book One. This book is uh, available from Cocho's Books in Canada, one of the most storied presses uh, in Canadian letters. Uh, you can easily Google this online if you're curious enough to want to purchase it or uh, take a sample from it and see what, if you might like it or not. I'm going to perform for you the final poem in this work so that you get some idea of its uh, aesthetic sensibilities. This work is entitled Alpha Helix. Jesper Hoffmeyer notes, the basic unit of life is the sign, not the molecule. Alpha Helix. Whatever lives must also write. It must strive to leave its gorgeous mark upon the eclogues and the Georgics already written by ancestral wordsmith. It must realign each ribbon of atoms into a string of words typing out each random letter in a stock quote spooling bias on a banner at the bourse. It is alive because it can rebuild itself from any line of text. It must twist and twine upon itself just as the grapevine does upon the trellis. It must writhe within the fist of physics. It must wrench itself away from all the forces that might quell it. It preserves the lesson that we learn by chance in crisis. It carries coiled within itself a clustering which both strain and strife must teach us to unwind. We have seen its handiworks unraveled like the innards of a Rolex watch dissected on a black satin cloth in the workshop of a murdered jeweler. It is not a tangle, it is not a knot, although it might resemble a woven cable left disheveled like a strand of diodes forgotten in some bottom drawer. It is instead the fractal globule that unkinks itself into a wreath placed upon our tomb. We have seen it in the eddy of a whirlpool among the grottoes, and we have seen it in the gyre of a whirlwind among the grasses. It is the little vortex that can torque the course of evolution for every micrococcus. It links the flinching of jellyfishes to the twinkling of dragonflies. It binds us all together via ligatures of carboxyl and amidogen. It embroiders us with error. It never regrets the wistfulness of its daydreams. It never rebukes the hellishness of its gargoyles. It is but a fuse lit long ago. Its final blast delayed forever. The prime accord escorting a spark through every padlock on every doorway shot against the future. It emerges from the fluids in a bubble of Montmorilla night bursting forth as though by fiat to blight the entire planet. It replicates the rifling of a gun aimed at a moving target. We have seen it in the twirl of smoke from the prop wash of a biplane tail spinning after having barrel rolled through a dog fight. We have seen it in the contrail of a zero whose faithful kamikaze must loop the loop while he skywrites his graffiti in the clouds above his grave site. It has printed on the sand flat this fragile epitaph of sigils cursing the tsunami. It has tattooed upon itself invisible but indelible logo glyphs, too intricate to be utterable. It is compulsive, like a graphomaniac, unable to make his left hand stop the chalk from drawing spirals across the drywall of his cell. It is a stack of our glasses telling time for ballerinas who must pirouette upon their pins inside our mirror boxes. It conjures forth from nothingness a nightingale by reciting stray words no longer than three letters, it evokes the trilling of a songbird better than any ballads sung by choirs of sonneteers and serenaders. We have seen it in the jigsaw puzzle of a rose whose perfect pieces lie in scattered fragments on the steps of spiral stairs. We have seen it in the ivy that, like a verdant feather boa, curls around the barber pole standing in the junkyard of our semiotic failures. It has called to mind for us a slinky which must somersault forever down the ascending escalator in the most sublime of all museums. It has spun the myriad raffle drums within which our lots, when chosen, summon one of us to face a sudden 
threat in brutal combat to the death. It is but a solenoid of copper wiring which must embrace the iron stem of an unseen orchid grown by electromagnets. It is a feedback loop feeding upon itself inside a quickening centrifuge. It is the wobble of a gyroscope spinning inside the satellite whose flyby orbit slingshots a golden discus toward a distant exomoon. It burrows like a corkscrew through the plumes of whitewash in the wake of a torpedo. It zigzags wayward to our doom. It runs riot in the Von Karman streets where gusty winds can cause up hoisted telephone lines to whine like sirens in advance of a tornado. We have seen it in the twisted trusses of an extended aluminum ladder bent along its length by the ravages of a cyclone. We have seen it in the umbilicus of a water spout, which must hula like a stream of syrup being poured into the ocean by a storm cloud. It is but a turbofan viewed through the eye hole of a lug nut held up like a monocle to the fina kistoscope of such a screw blade. It must build for us a giant auger that can drill a bore hole through the azoic layer of bedrock far below the depth of any buried fossil. It must delve through zones of Vishnu schist far older than the Ammonites now piratized like cogs of brass embedded in the shale. We have seen it in the swirling fight of zebra moths succumbing to the fire, and we have seen it in the twirling plunge of sable hawks nose diving to the prey. It must plummet through a funnel which is spinning like a hypno disc at the center of every funhouse pinwheel. It is a lathe machining offshoots of itself, all its curlicues of shaven silver, no more than spirogyra under microscopes. It is the tusk extracted from the skull of a narwhal. It is what the fakir must evoke when he plays his ragas on a flute, bewitching a duet of vipers curled around an ivory stick like rainbows on a maypole. We have seen it in the rope that hangs the felons, and we have seen it in the whip that goads the slaves. It has knit itself into a sylvan laurel, not unlike the diadem of dazzling moonlets that encompass the carousel of Saturn. It can circumnavigate a shooting star en route to Alpha Lyra. It can generate a gigantic field of magnetism so intense that over time, its torsions into lace ephemeral filaments of stardust. It must crumple up the spider web of space-time, hauling it like a trawl net down into the maelstrom of a quasar. It must test itself, proving its intelligence by eternally replaying the same game of Glashberlinspiel upon an atomic abacus. It must calculate the odds of life, delaying the doomsday of the universe. It is but a typewrote that crosses all abysses. It is but a tether that lets us undertake this spacewalk. Do not be afraid when we unbraid it. We were never intended to be tied to whatever made us. Thank you, one and all, for having me as a participant in today's session. I'm very grateful to have been here. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Christian. It was great to have you here today and, um, and hear that fantastic text. Um, we have run ahead of time, um, but hopefully that's okay um, for everybody that um, we've got through just a little bit more quickly than we thought we would. Um, just to close the session, uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us in the second session of the Machine Forum. Uh, and I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking all three of today's panellists and um, Liz, our respondent, for such a great session. Um, as I said earlier, the Machine Forum will resume tomorrow on Zoom at 2pm for our final session, uh, which will bring a mathematician and an artist together. And we'll also see the launch of a commissioned online artwork by artist Sean Dockray, listening to the diagnostic ear which engages with a very timely theme, COVID diagnosis and metadata. We really look forward to you joining us. If you'd like to book into the session or view the online artwork from Thursday, please do check our Potter website for details. I've dropped or am going to drop the web link for the forum into chat again 
for you all. And just a quick final reminder that the session recordings will also be posted on the Potter website in the coming weeks. So please do sign up to our email news or check our socials to receive news of this and other activities. Thanks so much, everybody, for your support of our programs. Um, and enjoy your afternoon. Stay safe. And I'll just drop that little link into chat. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>